Welcome to the Make and Design Podcast. I'm your host, Karina Gardner. On this podcast, we're unraveling the everyday joys and dilemmas of design, making, and business. For makers who want to be designers and for designers who are makers, this is your inside scoop to help you grow your business and bring more creativity to your life. Hi guys, today I am here with Melissa Esplin. Melissa is um, someone I've known for a very long time, like all the way back to our bachelor degrees, right? Our bachelor degrees? Is that when we? I think so. <laughs> yeah. So I think, so I think we met back at college all the way there. Yeah. I can't even remember. Anyway, I thought today would be such a great day to talk with Melissa about where she started and where she ended up because um, it's similar, but she got really niched down. And I think it'll be fun to hear kind of how she got there. So Melissa, you want to tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Yes. Hi, I'm Melissa Esplin and I live in Utah, currently born and raised. I graduated from BYU with a degree in painting and drawing. And honestly, I never, ever thought in a million years I would go to BYU, Brigham Young University. And it's, it was a rival school from uh, University of Utah, which is, I was raised in University of Utah stomping grounds. So I thought I was going to go there. I ended up at BYU. It was a great experience. I focused on painting and drawing, but in order to work my way through school to pay for school, I got a graphic design job on campus and taught myself graphic design programs. And since, you know, figuring out these graphic design programs and learning about painting and drawing and seeing the connection between these programs and how the analog version works and how closely they're connected, I wanted to bridge that gap and I, I kept trying to bridge that gap and um, my professors hated it, <laughs> to be honest. Well, I feel like the department at BYU because my, my undergrad degree is not actually in art or in any of mm-hmm. the, I was, I was in the HVAC, but I was on the other side, but they really compartmentalized those departments. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You know, and, and the, the running joke was, that the illustrators don't make art, but the painting and drawers don't know how to actually draw. Like the fine artists don't actually know how to draw. And it was this funny like banter back and forth, but they, and they, they'd make it funny. But I think at the end of the day, it was a deep seated, like, um, I'm not sure that it was a hatred because I think each department was jealous of the other. And so it created this rift. And I almost didn't get the F in my BFA. They hated my project (laughs) so much. (laughs) What was your project? Now I have to know. So my senior show was, I actually got a grant for it, which was great because the printing costs alone were like $1,400. And for a poor starving college student, that was pretty significant. So I created 10 three foot by six foot vinyl banners that I designed an illustrator and created these really crazy, vibrant, abstract paintings in illustrator. And it was this dialogue that graphic art is fine art. I was just trying to pull that into the gallery setting so you could see sort of that um, mixture. I mean, Milton Glaser, everyone reveres him as this fine artist. He's a graphic designer. You know, I wanted to, I wanted to start a dialogue about how graphic design is art in everyday life. I love accessibility. I just like see in your head my project, your project. And I'm thinking, uh, like, I'm not surprised that they hated it. I am not even a (laughs) tiny bit surprised. Right. And it was cool because, so I, I lined the hallway of, um, one of the library halls at BYU with these vinyl banners and as you as people walk past the banners they'd sort of move and follow you so it just you you you, they followed you it was this it was kind of interactive I hadn't intended on it being interactive but it was and it created this cool experience where this graphic design this graphic art follows you and that's the case with the graphic design that we see all around us you know got milk 
Nike, just do it. Like these things follow us. They, they stick with us. And so I, I wanted to create a dialogue and they're like, well, it would have been more successful. Had you done all of this in oil? I'm like, no, that was my point was to do it in illustrator. You have no idea how much time and effort each of these files takes. And you understand Karina illustrator files, vector format files are very small in nature. Typically they're like in the kilobyte. And this was back in 2006 when kilobytes were kind of a big deal. Um, each of my Illustrator files were 50 megabytes. Yeah, you probably had troubles with that because I was looking through all my old stuff and I, we were still using zip, fi zip files. What was that? Mm -hmm. What were they called? Yeah. Zip files. Anyway, zip files, yeah. And you could barely put anything on it if you were doing graphics. Yeah. It was like you had gazillions of them. So mm -hmm. that, that yeah. is so crazy. Yeah. And I, the printers gave me a hard time. They're like, what did you do in these files? And it's just, I, I didn't actually use any um, raster bitmap graphics. So no pixelated graphics. It was all vector based. So just lots of layers, lots of different patterns. So many things going on. <laughs> and and anyway. I do. Some of them I've actually cut up and framed so that they're just like actual frames. And then I still have some in rolls just in my basement, just hanging out. Oh my gosh. I love hearing art projects because so my bachelor's degree, I didn't have to do a portfolio like that, but my, for my graduate degrees, I have an art minor and mm -hmm. I did a series of different paintings, but one of the paintings I did which my professors laughed at and my OBGYN was concerned about was a, a belly painting. So while mm -hmm. I was like nine months pregnant and about to graduate and I did, I had a canvas and I painted the whole thing with my belly. And I love that. I was, love that so much. It was so great. And when I went to the doctor for one of my last visits, she was like, what is going on here? Because I couldn't see underneath my belly. So I had all the green paint was still there. She thought I had like fungus or something. She was like, I have never seen this before. And I was just like, oh, I painted. I painted with my belly. And she was like, oh, this is paint. And I was like, it probably is. I can't see it. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> That's so good. That's so good. What we will do for art. <laughs> it's it's true. And, you know, graduating from the BFA program at BYU, I realized I hated the gallery scene. That's kind of what that experience cemented for me is I hated the gallery scene because it was all about this um, inside dialogue. You had to be a certain person in order to understand the dialogue. And it was this, for lack of a better word, you had to be privileged in order to even enter into this world and have your artwork shown in this world. So I was like, I'm not about that. I like making pretty things. And I like when anybody can look at it and see pretty things. Um, I, I kind of like the idea of the parable, like the biblical parables. It's a nice story. If you're, if you're look, listening to the stories, it's just a nice story. You can look at it that way. But then if you look beyond the story, you can see symbolism and meaning and things like that. But that's what I want. I want a parable in, you know, visual art form. And I just, I didn't feel like I really got that. And my husband got a job in California. So we moved out there and I thought, oh, I'm going to do great things. It's going to be amazing. 2008 happens. Crap hits the fan. And we saw the writing on the wall. Um, I, we saw Chris was Chris's billable hours were getting cut way back. And, and I, and he had a meeting with his supervisors at the end of the month. And so I said, okay, Chris, I'm going to pack up all of our stuff. We're going to move back to Utah. It's going to be so much cheaper. We can actually live off of our savings if we move back to Utah. So you stay here and like couch surf until you get fired and then come join me in Utah. Well, we packed everything up the day before we moved out. Like I was moving out with our, at the time, 11 month old daughter, uh, Chris got fired. <laughs> it's like you perfectly planned it, Melissa. <laughs> we perfectly planned it. So, so um, with you, right? 
So you just yeah. like moved so together. Moved. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I was like, is this weird that I'm happy about this? <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. So, so we moved back we, to Utah. And we got back to Utah. We lived with a combination of my parents and my in-laws for a couple months. And, you know, it just wasn't, it, I needed my own space, especially when you have a toddler, you need your own space. So we, we rented a space. I got a job as a graphic designer for Down East Basics. Oh my gosh. I forgot that. I remember that. That was, a good yeah. that feels like a long, long time ago. Okay. It was a long, long time ago. Okay. And that it was, was like the early stages when they first barely started. I yeah. See. Like it was really early, I feel like. Yeah, it was maybe like two years or three years after they had started the basics line. And so they wanted me to do the email blast for them. So I was doing the email blast. And as a result, I, I kind of had all this free time to just dink around. I could, I could be a little bit playful with the design, although they hated it. They typically hated all the playfulness. Melissa, I'm, I'm hearing a little bit of a theme here. Are you a little bit of a rebel? <laughs> Maybe I just like just pushing people just just a little bit outside the comfort zone. Um, but at this time, my all the men in my family had lost their jobs, all of them. And my dad, he lost his job. He got a job offer in Charlotte, North Carolina. So they were packing up their home of 23 years and moving to North Carolina. And in the process, my mom calls me up. I have a book for you. And I'm like, you know, I don't read. <laughs> I just don't read. I'm not a very well-read person. So I'm like, this sounds really not fun. Okay, whatever. So she's like, don't let me forget. I have this book for you. I have this book for you. So anyway, I inherit my great, great grandfather's resource book that he used he was a calligrapher and sign painter in Ogden Utah and it was like the heavens opened and I was like oh my gosh where has this been my whole life like I've always been interested in letters and letter forms and I'd done posters for people but I didn't know how to use a computer I hand lettered everything you know because that's how you do it you know I had good ish handwriting so this was just like this just poured a whole lot of gasoline on this tiny little fire. And I was like, oh my gosh, my world has been changed. Um, and just seeing these letter forms, I, I dove right in and I had no idea what I was doing and I made every mistake possible. And it was really ugly. It was really bad. It was so bad. <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm thinking about all my first stuff too. And it is so ugly. People don't believe you because they only, they see what you're doing now. And they're like, oh, you're so beautiful. Like you're doing beautiful stuff now. And they're comparing their old, they're, they're, they're brand new with your like 10 years, 14 years in stuff. Yeah. Oh mm -hmm. man, the ugly stuff. That's, uh, that's so funny. So you weren't and, at it. You weren't. Oh no, I was so bad. I, well, I didn't have a lot of materials. I didn't have great materials. There weren't a whole lot of resources. There was um, iampeth.com online and, um, iampeth is a, it, back in the day, it, it's gotten a rewrite since then. So it's easier to navigate. And I'm a member of iampeth now, and I'm actually teaching in two weeks at the convention at iampeth. So I think things have kind of come full circle, but it was such a hard site to navigate. I couldn't really digest any of the information that was on there. There was no Pinterest. There was no Skillshare. There was there was no Instagram or any of this stuff. So it was like, well, let's just throw stuff at the canvas and see what sticks. And, you know, trial and error, I figured out a couple of things here and there. I found a couple of forums. It was really helpful. I found some books. And that was kind of when things started to snowball. And I had a blog at the time and people kept asking me, how do you do this? And I wasn't making any money off my blog. And I just quit uh, Down East Basics over the course of a few months. And so I, I was like, I need to make money off of this. I need, I, I need to monetize this. I can't just give this information away for free. I've worked hard with my practice. I need to charge money for this. 
So it, it was funny, this like back and forth with my husband, like I need to, I need to do something. He's like, write a book. I'm like, no, no, I think it needs to be online. And he's like, okay, write a blog post. I'm like, yeah, but it needs to be private and people need to pay for it. He's like, okay, okay. And like, none of these platforms, like think if they existed. So this was a time my husband was transitioning his whole thing. He was a financial analyst and he was transitioning to web developer because a web developer could make twice as much um, as this experienced financial analyst at the time. And so he's like, well, I'm going to do web development. So I just, I decided I need to start writing the content. I need to start teaching classes locally and write the content out. And I, so I started doing that and um, I got an offer from someone to teach on their platform, but I felt like it was just a little bit low. I, I, it was, it was enticing at the time because we were super poor, but I still felt like I needed to value, my, value myself more. And this is like the only time in my life where I've ever felt that way. <laughs> <laughs> I always chronically undervalue myself, but this was that moment where I was like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to say no. I never say no, but I'm going to say no. And, um, Chris got fired from another job and it was, it was a terrible job. Um, they ended up going bankrupt. It was a hot mess. So anyway, he gets fired, but we just felt all this peace. And he's like, you know what, Melissa, I'm going to build you that website. I'm going to build it for you. We'll just make it from scratch. And so in the six weeks that he was unemployed, he built my website from scratch and calligraphy.org was born. Granted, it was under a different name. It was under I Still Love Calligraphy and Chris hated that name so much. He's like, this is so like girly and lame. You need like a single word URL. So he was the one who lobbied for calligraphy.org. But um, but that was when it was born. And, you know, it, it was a lot of, content writing, a lot of video and editing and all this work. And I poured it out there and I had about a thousand email subscribers by the time I launched, which I feel like is a pretty decent number for launching something from scratch. New. Brand and especially new. Especially back then, because back then, like, so I actually even killed all my subscribers two years ago before I launched my mm -hmm. new site because they were all so old. And like, I was like, mm -hmm. I don't even know if any of these emails still exist anymore. Um, Cause I think when yeah. you were doing that, I was teaching illustrator at jessicasprig.com. Like back yeah. in the day, cause that, that was what I was doing. Um, and I remember that because she had a very specialized website. There was no platform for us to put it on. And when I moved to teach on my own site, it became very difficult. I had to build this whole like backend situation and it was very mm -hmm. frustrating like so oh, frustrating yeah. and I was like, what am I doing? So uh, it's so funny because then two years ago I started my new site and I'm using Kajabi now and it's so easy, it's crazy. Like it's so crazy. Are you still, yeah, it's using, not, what are you using now? I'm still using, well, I'm not using the same platform but I'm still using a platform that my husband built. He, he built, he didn't, he integrated it with Shopify so we yeah. don't have to have our own shopping cart flow, which I'm not a UX or UI designer. So using tools that work and exist and people are familiar with like Shopify is really great. Um, but I do still use my own um, like other backend for the content and the feedback and everything for my classes. So, but it's been a few rewrites since, that was 2012 at the time. Mm -hmm. So we've had a few rewrites since then. The internet's grown up a little bit since then. Yeah, for sure. Crazy. Like the short 10 year period, like how many jumps it's been, it's been kind of insane, really and truly. Oh yeah. So I mean, people were still using Flash on their websites. Oh my gosh, I was still using Flash and I was like, oh, I've gotta be done with this. But like I did for my master's degree, I did a whole Flash project. Like I was doing all this Flash stuff and now it's like outdated. Like who uses it anymore? No one. It's so- I don't know anyone that does. 
So it always makes me wonder like what's going to be outdated and what do you have to learn next to make sure and keep up on things because it's nuts. I tell the story all the time to my design suite users and that's that we used to teach Quark at the University of Minnesota and three weeks before class began Quark took away their license to colleges and mm -hmm. it was like that was basically their death because Adobe had given us a license for InDesign so three weeks mm -hmm. before they said all the professors all the teachers you guys are all learning InDesign that's what we're teaching our students well, if that's oh what you gosh. teach your students and they come out of school, guess what they ask for? They ask for InDesign, not Quark. And like, I think it killed that software, which seems so oh, crazy. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So it it's just kind of bonkers how things have grown and warped. I mean, it wasn't until 2014 that we started to see the rise of Skillshare. And that, um, that definitely influenced things on our end for sure you know I wanted to make sure that we were different enough from Skillshare that people would take a Skillshare class and also take my class and feel like they could come away with something unique and different um, but but the interesting thing about launching calligraphy.org in its primary stages in 2012 is that it was cricket for a month I think I made one or two sales in that first month that we launched and I, I had a healthy you made email. One or two cells because yeah. I just think like being on your own website is so difficult because you there's like mm -hmm. there weren't very many traffic drivers back then. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's that's where um, it was all about word of mouth and it was about the blogs, um, you know, saying, hey, I learned calligraphy from this website. She's really great. Take it, you know, check it out. And, and that really helped a lot. I, I think word of mouth really still, as far as calligraphy goes and learning calligraphy, word of mouth is better than like Facebook ads, just because if you like somebody's work and you, and they say, well, I learned here, then it's just, it, it feels like, okay, well, if, if this result could come from that teacher, then then I'll take the class from the teacher. I can trust the teacher. Whereas, whereas like Facebook ads, you can't really trust any of that because you can scrape all sorts of graphics off of any Instagram page and be like, yeah, check out this class. You know, it's not very real. Mm -hmm. So it's it's been an interesting journey, the way that we've grown. And like in the last two years, the way that we've plateaued and receded a little bit. <laughs> Just because of COVID or because you feel like the market's saturated? Um, the market's getting saturated, but I don't know that that's necessarily a problem. Um, I think personally, I'm just getting burned out and not to say that like, I don't want to be doing my job anymore. I love, and I'm obsessed with calligraphy and I love teaching. It's something that I really enjoy. It's just the hustle of like Instagram reels and Pinterest and all these things. And like, you know what? I'm done with that. I don't need to do that. People can come to me and that's great. So it's definitely certainly affected our sales for sure. And COVID also I've sort of optimized for my mental health in the last couple of years. That's made a huge difference. I know M Melissa and I were talking before we turned on the mic and started recording. We were talking about biking because I've been watching her bike on her Instagram. My husband's a biker. I have a road bike and I stink at it. I'm not very good. I'm more of a runner. But Melissa's like all the things like we were just talking about clipping in and I was like, what the heck have you gotten hurt? That's the real question. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, she's like, oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> I have to qualify that. I haven't had any nasty spills on the road bike. Oh, that's and good. I think that's where it gets bad. Yeah. Um, but like last week, I oh, a on show my it on YouTube. <laughs> if you're on YouTube, like, she's going to show us. I mean. You can't really see it anymore because, okay, have you heard of Tegaderm? Have you, no. Are you familiar with it? No. Oh, it's, it, it's magic. It is straight up magic. Toss all the band-aids out, get Tegaderm. You can get like a pack of a hundred from Amazon. You can get it from Walmart or Walgreens, whatever. But it's this clear film that you just like just put up on, on your stay and you can keep it on for a week. Is, and it, like, is it flexible? So like, can you put mm -hmm. it over an elbow or, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I put it on my knee as well. And it, 
it stayed just fine. Like the idea is, and this, this came from my dermatologist. He said, don't let anything scab over. So keep it wet. So by putting the Tegaderm on, it just keeps it sort of, it sounds gross, marinating in its own juices. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, obviously you clean out the wound before you put anything on it. But I'm just like thinking about it. Imagine I'm also last laughing at everyone who came to this podcast looking for art and design. And we're telling you <laughs> how to bandage up. This is like real life. So Melissa actually yes. was going to come to my house today. We were going to send the kids out to the pool and the two of us were going to be in real life, but kids happened and things didn't work out. So you guys are getting a zoom. I am hoping at some point it would be really fun to have her on the YouTube channel and the podcast, like showing you guys some things. And that way you can go check out her classes. Cause I think that would be really, really oh, fun. I'd love that. So at some point we'll have her on like in real life, the two of us will actually be together and doing something. Cause that's always really fun. Um, Melissa, are you, so you said you're teaching a class in two weeks live, right? Uh -huh. And then where can everybody find you? right now you can right now you can go to calligraphy.org and you can sign up for our email list and you'll get like this whole email telling you all about our class and get you familiarized with it or you can go to store.calligraphy.org and sign up for my online classes i teach very hands-on it's one-on-one -on -one coaching that you're paying for so there's so much information out there and I encourage you to seek out all the information possible, but I'm here to help you distill what information needs to be used and what can be tossed and help you figure out what works best for your hand, your limitations, your projects that you want. So that's really what I focus on the most. So amazing. Okay, you guys, I'm going to put that in our show notes so that you guys can go link over to our stuff and we'll see you later. Hey, did you know that you can visit me at makeanddesign.com to learn more about this podcast and join my VIP group for weekly freebies? I can't wait to see you there.